good evening, everyone, and welcome for coming, viewing this. Um, my name is Adrienne Jeanette. I am the curator of the Brunier Art Museum with University Museums, and I just want to say thank you so much for logging on for our virtual lecture today in conjunction with the exhibition Extravagant Dining, Glass A Parents from the collection of Dorothy Todd Kent. I want to thank Robert and Karen Duncan for their generous, generous donation of Karen's mother's A Parents collection. Make sure I get all those words out correctly. Um, and I also want to thank Kathy and John Howe for the support of our educational programs through the Ka Kathy and John Howe Enrichment Program. So just during the program, as most of you probably know, just keep your um, sound and video off if you don't mind. And at the end, we'll have time for our questions through the chat function, or if you really want to ask it, you can unmute yourself, but please wait till the end. So tonight I'm gonna to start, but first I want to introduce our, our esteemed guest and lecturer. Um, since 2001, Robert B. Dimmick has been writing about perfect propriety as the etiqueteer. An etiquette autodidact, Robert became interested in manners and special events through a childhood attending weddings and the discovery of his mother's copy of Emily Post. A proud graduate of Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan, Robert spent a 30-year career in special events, mostly in alumni relations at MIT, but also at the Boston Ballet. Fond of historical precedent, Robert has uncovered some interesting material on no gifts, please, the use of paper napkins, just when it's okay to wear seersucker, and the popular history of Sunday brunch program uh, for Northeastern University. He has hosted etiquette di dinners for students at both MIT and Boston University, affiliated since 2012 with the Gibson House Museum, Boston's best Victorian house museum. Robert has given several programs there on Victorian domestic life and host his annual repeal celebration there in early December, which sounds amazing. So I think we should all go. Um, you can read more of what Etiquetteer has to say and ask your own questions by following him at etiquetteer.com and on Facebook at, 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 at I'm gonna, I can't mouthful the same too many times in a row. Etiquetteer. <laughs> Etiquetteer. And on Instagram at, at, at Etiquetteer1. Look. Anyways, I'm really happy you're here and thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm gonna start tonight by sharing my screen and just talking a little bit about aparens in general. It's a very strange word and a very strange thing for most people. Uh, most people have no idea what it is. And I share a little bit about the collection that we received from Karen and Robert Duncan. So let me just open that up. And then I'm gonna go to you from the beginning. Oh, hold on. Allison, is it showing the notes still? Yes. Um, move over to display settings at the top there. I can't get to it. I'm waiting for the thing to disappear. Sorry. Sorry. This is never easy, is it? There okay. you go. There you go. It went away? Yep. Uh, oh. No, you need to click on display settings. I can't. Oh, there it goes. Ha, there you go. It. Sweet. OK, perfect. It was a different place when we did it earlier. OK. Let's start this now. So here we have some beautiful silver aparens. So aparens are something that was created in the 18th century, but comes from a French precedent, thus the very French name of aparen, of something called a surtout, which would have been on the center of your dining table and would have contained all the things you needed for your dining. So your casters or your cruets possibly, or your salt cellars and all of those different things, along with fruits and decorations and sweetmeats and the things you would see in these later versions. Uh, in the 18th century, it translates over to English with this apern. And these are mostly created in silver at this point in time. And they are wildly over the top. And they were meant to be a virtuoso work of a silversmith or goldsmith. So in the 18th century, you have a huge generation of silversmiths that has come over from France, or they're the second generation makers of Huguenot background. So these were French Protestants that were persecuted and, and pretty much kicked out of, had to leave France after 1685. They come over to England and they start making 
really amazing silver because they're already highly skilled craftsmen and they work in other areas too but some of the silver is some of the best silver made in the early 18th century and this is also when the rococo comes into um, play and is very popular the rococo is if you've ever looked at um, some of the most wildly ugly things in the world some people would say later but for me they're some of the most beautiful and it's the idea of using shell work and rokai um, you're also using asymmetry you see the little kind of beautiful floral feet on these aperns they are often kind of off balance looking some of the terrines and the silver and it really really takes its own form in silver because silver has the ability to form and mold to all these beautiful um, variations that you find in the Rococo in the 1730s, that early time period. Aperns themselves are being made in silver and made to be these presentation pieces because silver is cash. Silver is money. It is, is something that you have to be incredibly wealthy to own let alone a few pieces of small silver hollowware, say like a, a teapot or something like that. But to own a giant centerpiece for your table means you have a lot of money. You're doing pretty well because silver can always be melted down, right? And when you melt down silver, then you have cash. So these are two later versions, um, mid-century, just after mid 18th century by Thomas Pitts, who becomes probably one of the best known. He specializes in a parent. And these two are very beautiful. You see all the Pierce work. If you are in the Midwest, you can go see that one at Nelson Atkins Museum. I know Allison, our collections manager who's here just did. Uh, they are very, they're almost incredibly delicate and uh, lifelike. They, they have a, their own lives. And they are using chinoiserie, which is also very much a part of this time period and with the Rococo, that idea of taking characteristics of East Asian designs and also representing East Asian people in a way that is not technically correct because most Western European artists didn't have an, had no idea what East Asian people actually look like or what they like. So these are very pagoda designed parents, as you can see. The one from Nelson Atkins, I think, has nine arms. Or may so when you have nine arms, those are some of the most um, intense of the most that have the most uh, um, uh, the most intricate. And these would have had sweet meats and other types of things, fruit, um, possibly flowers, but much more about the food at this point. And again, you could have plucked one out while you were eating, or or the, and they were just meant to be these very over the top, ostentatious objects. We do have one on loan in the exhibition right now, just because I wanted to show that early piece from the Henry Ford, that early example. As you move on, we move on. Here's just an example of one with fruit. So you can see another Thomas Pitts without the pagoda part, and these have glass bowls. And then we start to move into neoclassical. So we start to restrain our design a little bit. We go from that over the top, ostentatious, um, looks like it could crawl across the table at you to a much more um, uh, simple design that uses classical antiquity as its source of inspiration. And so you can see that in the little lion paw here and also the, the beadwork and the scrolls. So this is an interesting one because as we were talking about sterling silver, which is very expensive to have and a commodity, we move into Sheffield plate when they figure out in the mid 18th century that they can fuse a layer of silver to a layer of copper and then they can work that in its own way and they can actually sandwich the copper and then work that into hollowware, they realize that they can make a whole range of objects that are as, as expensive. And so Sheffield plate kind of changes the world of silver because they can make anything you can make in, pure, in sterling silver now in Sheffield plate. So here you see Matthew Bolton, who's probably the one of the best known proprietors of Sheffield Plate. Um, he was a, 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 a worked with Josiah Wedgwood and also Erasmus Darwin. He was a very learned and, and um, enlightened man. But you see his Sheffield Plate here with cut glass bowls. So cut glass bowls are going to refract light and reflect light and look really beautiful on a table. So cut glass was being implemented too and part of this too. You have got lead in that glass usually which helps with reflect, ref, refraction and reflection uh, and makes it more brilliant. Then we moved into electroplating. So Sheffield plate exists 
and is being used, but it still takes work to make it right because you still have to make the hollow wear itself. With electroplating, you now have the ability to make something out of nickel. So this is about 1840 when you start implementing electroplating, make something out of nickel, um, nickel or different alloys. And then, so you have the object and then you use the electroplating process to deposit silver on top in a thin layer. So you can make things very quickly with very little actual, it's actually pure silver on here rather than sterling silver. So even um, it's a, even softer. So the other issue with this is the more you polish it, the more you can see the substrate in the metal in between. So it, it's, um, you start to see that wear with plated silver that you can't actually keep it as, as nice as you would like if you don't, if, unless you wanna, you start worrying about getting into that lower level. Um, so things have to be replated over time. But here you can see, you can do just as intricate a design kind of a little over the top because we're getting into Victorian era. So we've got swans and um, caryatids on the other one with feet. So they start really throwing all the design elements into these different types of, of objects and appearance um, and all over furniture, everything that they're doing. So we move from silver to glass at this time too. So we've got all the silver and of course silver is, and even silver plate, much more accessible, but still, you know, ex expensive. But glass itself is becoming a huge commodity. And, you know, we've got the middle class growing and developing in the 19th century in England, and they want these things too. And so electroplating allows them to have access to buy some of these things. And glass itself as this burgeoning world of, different colors and iterations and, and ways to create becomes very popular in Victorian design. And the glassy parents themselves tend to go a little bit over the top in this English period um, in the late 18 or 18, I say 1870s, 80s, 90s. Um, and this is not one of ours, but I wanted to show you one with flowers. And we also see a transition. The glass is very beautifully colored or very intensely colored but you're moving to, to putting more flowers into these objects you'll see over time. You do start with baskets that you can put sweetmeats and the other different things into, but also flowers become much more present. And so you can see how the shape of the appearance have really shifted, even with those electric electroplated ones. So these are two of our showstoppers from the collection. Um, and these would both be English of this Victorian period. So these are usually characterized by that central bowl with a central stem and then the kind of shepherd hook crooks that the baskets would hang off of. And then also so you, they all fit into that brass um, or pleated silver um, armature that you see there. So are these delicate? Yes. Are they frightening? Absolutely. You kind of, every time you move around them, they kind of move and clink and, and make funny noises, which are not ideal, but they are kind of virtuosic uh, displays of glass blowing ability in this period. And this, you can see this intense desire for wildly colored new and novel things, which continues. We start to move through time and things get a little bit smaller and a little less intricate, not so many arms or baskets or breakable bits and bobs but also still working with that amazing color. So here we've got Vaseline, which we would call Vaseline glass, which is actually uranium glass, which means it fluoresces and it does, is slightly radioactive and is very popular at this time. We also have cranberry glass, which is also forever pop, um, of, uh, popular. And, but if you look closely in the, the riggery, the, the little leaves that are kind of going around, you see they have gold flecks and, um, and incorporated in that clear glass. So still making it very special. And these ones are still bigger, but not um, as big as those first ones. Uh, these ones then were starting to kind of move into the 20th century and you can kind of see that change in style uh, through the satin glass and the more restrained jack in the pulpit shape and the pink and clear over here, uh, the cranberry and clear. And then the yellow is, is very kind of modern looking compared to those other ones where you have a cased glass with two layers of the white with yellow. And um, this one actually is quite tall, but you just have the one central stem. So we're, we're simplifying the object more and more, right? Which makes it probably cheaper, um, more accessible, easier for people to have and to own and to keep. 
Then we keep moving in time. And these ones are actually quite a bit smaller than the other ones. And we've got an Italian one that is has overshot glass, meaning it's it's actually rough. They've rolled it in frit. Uh, and then on the far other side, the green one is an American version of a pressed glass. So it's a pressed glass company, North of a glass company. And you can see that it's now stemmed into pressed glass, which is um, very popular and a much easier way to make glass than blowing glass. And in the middle, one of my favorites, because I love um, Stuben and Tiffany, you have the Stuben Ivoire, which is very 1930s, much more kind of art decoy, that Jack in the pulpit shape, very simple. And again, these are, you're leaving behind the idea of sweet meats and fruits. These are, these are for the display of flowers. And then we just keep going on and getting kind of smaller. And now they're adding silver and silver plates. The etched glass is quite lovely on that one, but they're you know, not very big at all in comparison. And you have less and less pieces to the point where you even have just a one piece like that Jack in the Pulpit by Stu Ben. And here, this is just a really fun one from mid-century, this amazing kind of splashed mm -hmm. water droplet, which is quite beautiful in person and bright blue, but it's just two pieces that slot in together, much easier. Uh, not going to break it, hopefully, unless you drop it on the ground. And so I just wanted to say thank you one more time to Karen Duncan. She was here. You, there you can see some of the Aparens out on display in our gallery, which is open through December 17th. And you can see just how vibrant the colors. And actually, you can see that yellow one far off in the back corner and see how tall it is on the bottom. But Karen's mother collected these in Clarinda, Iowa. She loved a parents. She would buy them whenever she found them. And she didn't quite know where this would fit. And, and for our glass collection, we actually didn't have any parents. So it was a great way for us to add a new element, a new type of um, glass art to our collection. But I'm going to now turn it over and stop sharing to Robert so he can talk all about dining. All right, and here we go. Share screen. Share. Here we go and play. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> that's what we needed to know. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being here tonight and for having me here uh, as an adopted Bostonian. Uh, it's very special for me to be a part of something that's going on uh, at Iowa State because of what a friend said to me. Uh, a friend asked me recently how my program was coming for the University of Ohio. Uh, so I had to tell him a very funny story from a history book about Boston, Cleveland Amory's book, The Proper Bostonians. There was a Boston Brahmin matron walking across the common and she encountered two young women from the Midwest, tourists who were clearly very excited to be there. And where are you girls from, she asked them. And they very proudly said, Iowa. And the matron sniffed and she said, here, we pronounce it Ohio. So you just never know what's going to happen here in Boston. Before we leap into the elements of the Victorian dinner table, I do have one small caveat. I'm going to try to talk about table elements that are unique to the 19th century, or at least obsolete now, as much as possible. Since we are still drinking from wine glasses and eating off china plates, I will be talking about china and crystal a little bit less. I'm not going to follow up on uh, much of what Adrian had to say about Aperns and her excellent presentation, but I will note that Charles Dickens did not like them. Hideous solidity was the characteristic of the podsnap plate, he wrote in his novel, Our Mutual Friend. Everything was made to look as heavy as it could and take up as much room as possible. Everything said boastfully, here you have as much of me in my ugliness as if I were only lead, but I am so many ounces of precious metal worth so much an ounce. Wouldn't you like to melt me down? A corpulent, straddling apern blotched all over as if it had broken out in an eruption instead of been ornamented, delivered this address 
from an unsightly silver platform on the table. So Charles Dickens was not exactly a fan. The other risk of having an apron in front of you is that you could not always see who was seated across the table. The critical advice from Mrs. Beaton and other domestic writers of the century was that the centerpiece should be low enough for people to see over it. I sometimes think that they had to say this in reaction to large aperns like this one and other showy pieces because an apern was definitely not low to the table. But this barricading effect could be achieved with flowers as well as anything else. I am very fond of the diaries of Ellen Maury Sladen, the Virginian-born wife of a Texas congressman at the turn of the last century. She had a sharp eye and usually a sharper tongue. There was an 1898 dinner at the Mexican legation that she and her husband attended, and she recorded the dinner was fairly good and well served, but flowers and candles were so thick down the center of the table that people opposite you seemed in ambush. Perhaps the Mexican hostesses did not have a copy of Mrs. Beaton to guide them in diplomatic entertaining. This period illustration on the screen now will give you an idea of what could be achieved. So you could do a lot more than just have an apron on the center of your table. There were sometimes in this period centerpieces made out of molded sugar. Somebody referred to them as saccharin architecture. They would be quite elaborate and could form follies with statues inside them or some such. But my favorite idea of a centerpiece, not made of sugar, is an electric light shaped like a rooster. And I really wish I had an image to share with you. Mrs. Sladen was told about it at a Washington luncheon party. Mrs. Wycliffe, a young woman who has social zeal without too much knowledge, gave a luncheon party and had the emblem of democracy in electricity for a table decoration. The rooster, in fact, is the mascot for the Democratic Party, chosen for itself back in 1840 to counteract the more popular mascot selected by their opponents years before the jackass, which we know as the donkey. Celery had quite a 19th century vogue, which led to the creation of the celery vase. A couple of examples we see here from the museum's collection. Yes, they were centerpieces. They were edible centerpieces in the 19th century. Tall glass vases, often with a foot and big enough for a head's worth of celery stalks or more. Let's hope the servants remember to cut off the bottom so that no one inadvertently pulled out an entire head when trying to get a stalk. Well before World War I, table fashions changed so that celery became served in low dishes, which is what we think of, horizontal and not vertical. And these may or may not have been repurposed in other rooms. Before we go on, I'd like to talk a little bit about why the 19th century fostered so much innovation in American eating. While the Industrial Revolution ground down a lot of people into poverty, it also brought either great wealth or comfortable prosperity to a class of people unused to either. They could now afford to buy nice things, and the market was ready for them. The nation's expanding rail network and the invention of refrigeration that could even be used on rail cars allowed more and different kinds of foods to get more places safely and quickly. For instance, pineapples and bananas. Finally, the discovery of the Comstock load in 1859 provided massive amounts of raw materials for silversmiths to use creating new designs and products for the table. Put all this together and you have a perfect storm of obscure bits and pieces like strawberry forks, orange spoons, asparagus tongs, and an armory of different kinds of knives. 
So just as an idea of what a diner might be getting into, I want to share with you a sample menu I discovered from a delightful book called Savory Suppers and Fashionable Feasts by Susan Williams. This menu was served by a housewife in upstate New York in 1884, and I'll bet she had some help in the kitchen. Fresh oysters on the half shell, mock turtle soup, lobster farci, if you said it in English, it would be stuffed lobster, fillet of beef with mushroom sauce, green peas and pickled peaches, French salad, and then oranges, grapes, and figs for the fruit course, they must have skipped dessert. Now, just what is a French salad? Is it with French dressing? Actually, no. Susan Williams explains that it's really what we think of as a green salad, one of the most pervasive French influences during the early 19th century, and it rapidly became an integral part of any dinner. It was often, she said, preceded by the word French to identify it as a green leafy salad dressed with oil and vinegar, mashed egg yolk, and a little mustard, as distinct from the chicken or lobster salads, which were also quite common. It's become a vogue here in, in our lifetimes, in the last 40 years or so, to serve the salad dressing on the side because a lot of people went on diets. But in the 19th century, it wasn't a salad unless it was dressed. So dinner begins. The basis of any dinner table is, of course, the tablecloth, which should be of as good a quality as means will afford, said Mrs. Beaton in her famous household book. She also recommended that it be only very slightly starched, for if it was made too stiff, the corners of the tablecloths, instead of falling in natural folds, stand out awkwardly and the table napkins are unpleasant to use. In the 19th century, it was not unusual for a dinner to include two or even three tablecloths, one on top of the other. Once the roast was off the table, the first tablecloth would be completely removed exposing the second, also white, tablecloth underneath it. That, in turn, might be removed after dessert and savory had been served so that fruit and coffee would be served on a bare table. Obviously, we don't do these things now because, well, servants. But using more than one tablecloth actually fell out of fashion before we get to the year 1900. How would a dining room be lit? Gaslight became standard in the 19th century, but most dining tables included candelabra or candlesticks. Candles on the dinner table helped both with illumination and to beautify the scene. Let's face it, candlelight is still flattering. The general rule was that there should be one candle per person. It was also typical in the 19th century to provide candle shades tiny lampshades that fit over the top of the candle to keep the glare of the flame from blinding everyone. Another solution would be to stand your candelabra on ebony blocks. Candle shades, I think, are better. They would be lined with pink or red silk, which would cast a very flattering glow. For fans of Oscar Wilde in the audience tonight, you will remember what the adventurous Mrs. Erland said in Lady Windermere's fan. I would admit to 29 if there were pink shades, 30 if there were not. Every diner would get a napkin, of course, and often these would be monogrammed, which meant that if your good linens were inherited, you might have somebody else's monogram on your table. Remember the old Yankee dictum, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Believe it or not, often a roll or a piece of bread would be rolled into one's napkin at a formal dinner table, even if the napkin had been folded elaborately. So there would not be a bread plate. Emily Post, remembering the dinner table of yesterday, wrote, bread was always rolled in the napkin and usually fell on the floor. In the age of excess, 
Mrs. Post wrote about the decorative superabundance of the Victorian dinner table. She wrote, loading a table to the utmost of its capacity with useless implements, which only in rarest instances had the least value, would seem to prove that quantity without quality must have been thought evidence of elegance and generous hospitality. And the astounding part of this bad taste epidemic was that few, if any, escaped. Even those who had inherited colonial silver and glass and china of consummate beauty sent it dust gathering to the attic and cluttered their tables with stuffy and spurious lumber. So then as now, fashions come and go. Think of today's brides who don't want anything on the table that looks like it might have been grandma's. It wasn't uncommon, as I mentioned, for Victorians to overload the table with extra things. Emily Post continued, the entire table would be laden with little dishes and spoons. There were olives, radishes, celery, and salted nuts in glass dishes, and wherever a small space of tablecloth showed through, it was filled with either a big apostle spoon or little Dutch ones crisscrossed. These unusual spoons in the collection of the Gibson House Museum in Boston might have been used in just such a way. Robert Roberts, in his Guide for Butlers and Other Household Staff, wrote that spoons give glass a brilliant display. So now that we are at the table, the first course would be likely to start with oysters. Uh, if it wasn't oysters, it might be clams or caviar. What's unique about serving oysters is that the oyster fork is the one fork to go on the right of your place setting. Its proper place is nestled into the bowl of the soup spoon. Oyster forks were not always meant to bring the oyster to your mouth but only to be absolutely sure that the oyster was completely dislodged from its shell. Oyster plates could not be used for anything else. They contained depressions for five to seven oysters and sometimes an additional hollow for mignonette or other sauce. This plate is perhaps the most famous oyster plate of the 19th century. It belongs to the White House service commissioned by First Lady Lucy Hayes. An exuberant interpretation of American flora and fauna, the 1879 Haviland and Lamage service was designed by American artist Theodore Russell Davis. This plate has five depressions for oysters arranged in what is sometimes called a turkey pattern because its shape might suggest a turkey. After oysters, we come to the soup. And in the 19th century, once upon a time, two soups used to be offered at dinner parties, one clear and one thick or cream. But you could only choose one. As the 19th century went on, the cream soup got left out and the clear soup became the only choice. Another reason might be that each kind of soup required a different shaped spoon. Cream soups are eaten with a round soup spoon, but clear soups use a traditional oval soup spoon. I've included here a photograph of the Gibson family's Limoges Turin from the Gibson House Museum in Boston, because at least through the mid-century, the soup would sometimes be served by the hostess at table. Mrs. Beaton tells us how in her household book. The guests being seated at the dinner table, the lady begins to help the soup, which is handed round, commencing with the gentleman on her right and on her left and continuing in the same order till all are served. I can imagine how risky this feels for the guests to be passing soup bowls down the table but this tureen is one of my favorite pieces in the Gibson House collection. A friend of mine referred to the fish knife as the most elegant of blades. And in fact, the fish knife is an invention of the 19th century, but it starts in Britain, not in America. 
according to Mara Graber's wonderful book about obscure tableware called What Have We Here? The fish knife is the epitome of gentility. With a scalloped shaped blade, the end is just pointy enough to pick small bones from a cooked fish, and the flat blade is useful for sliding between the flesh and the skin. She also notes, the thought that an ordinary silver knife might be able to serve the purpose just as well seems to have been politely put to one side. People did use science to justify this addition to the table setting. Before silver fish knives came along, people would use steel knives for their fish, but it came to be thought that steel tainted the flavor of the fish because it reacted with the acids in the sauce served with the fish. This can sometimes be an issue for fruit knives as well. So more silver on the table turned out to be wonderful. Now, besides a fish knife, you also have a fish slice. This is a perforated serving knife, especially for serving fish, basically what we would think of as a very fancy spatula. These are not a 19th century innovation, but I note that in the mid 18th century, they finally got fish shapes incorporated into their designs. And you can see the dolphin motif in the center of the blade here. Following the fish, you would have the roast. And I want to use this section to talk about carving and about service and also about condiments. Carving used to take place at the table, usually the host, but sometimes another gentleman. It's interesting to note that for family dinners, a smaller tablecloth or a napkin might be brought out to protect the tablecloth from a carving accident, but not, it seems, at a formal dinner. There's one mishap I need to tell you about. On one occasion, it was the eminent politician Daniel Webster who had to carve, and he was not the host. The roast that was brought to his place to carve was a large, greasy goose. Somehow or another, whoosh, the big bird went sailing off the platter and into the lap of the beautiful young lady sitting at Mr. Webster's left. So Mr. Webster did what many have done before, and I'm sure since, he blamed the victim. Turning with dignity to the lady, he said, Madam, I will thank you for that goose. Carving at table took place less as the century moved on because of another innovation in formal dinner service known as service à la Russe. Before, service à la Française was more typical, which is a fancy way to say family style. For service à la Française, all the dinner was put on the table at once, beautifully and symmetrically arranged, and it was pretty much open season, pitting guest against guest as they served themselves. Gentlemen were also responsible for serving the ladies that they brought into dinner, adding to the fun. Service à la Russe eliminated the fear of not getting enough to eat. Instead of helping yourself to everything at once, servants would carve at the sideboard and go from guest to guest with the next course on a tray from which the guests would help themselves. Mrs. Beaton continued, dinners à la Russe are scarcely suitable for small establishments, a large number of servants being required to carve and to help the guests, besides there being a necessity for more plates, dishes, knives, forks, and spoons than are usually found in any other than a very large establishment. Where, however, a service à la Russe is practicable, there is perhaps no mode of serving a dinner so enjoyable as this. I have a feeling that there are some Edith Wharton fans in the audience tonight. How many of you have read The Age of Innocence? I fancy that Servis à la Russe is what Wharton meant when she had Sillerton Jackson say about the wedding breakfast, my dear fellow, haven't you heard? It's to be served at small tables in the new English fashion. I like to tell one story about Servis à la Russe, though it isn't of the Victorian period, to illustrate how important it is to be considerate of the servants. 
The Duke and Duchess of Windsor entertained a great deal when they lived in Paris, and the Duchess had a bad habit of letting the footman stand next to her with a hot and heavy silver tray of meat while she would talk with her guests. Make no mistake, she knew exactly what she was doing. One footman, who was older perhaps than the others in service, finally had enough and leaned forward sufficiently that the hot edge of the tray grazed the bare skin of Her Royal Highness's arm. She never kept a footman waiting again after that, and I understand he was considered a hero in the servants' hall. Now I want to turn to the Victorian use of condiments, particularly the caster set of cruets and other things. And these are things from the museum's collection. There would be cruets for oil and vinegar, containers for salt and pepper, and a variety of other cruets that might be used for things like soy sauce. In the image at left, if you look at the far left, you can see the mustard pot. It's shorter than everything else. Um, and I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. Um, a sugar caster was sometimes included, and I will talk more about that when we get to dessert. The handle on top made it easy to pass either from guest to guest, or perhaps more likely by the servants. A dinner caster might hold up to six cruets, casters for breakfast and lunch held less. And of course, there might be salt cellars also, tiny silver or glass dishes with tiny spoons for you to use to scatter salt over your meal. Cruet stands and casters were obsolete by the time we get to World War I. Why is that? Why was there such a change in styles and in what people used when they were eating? I tend to lay some of the credit at the feet of interior designer Elsie DeWolf, who greatly simplified how Americans decorated their homes. She tossed out anything extraneous or excessive wholesale, believing in optimism and white paint. And that change really started happening in the first decade of the 20th century. Now, I want to move on to my favorite course in a 19th century dinner, asparagus. Celebrity vegetable of the 19th century, asparagus was held in such high esteem that it merited its own course. It would then be served on its own platter on top of a cloth napkin on a tray offered by the footman. It's important to note that they all had to be pointing in the same direction on the tray, otherwise it would look very sloppy. They would be served with special asparagus tongs like these, which date from 1865. Most but not all asparagus tongs look like these, narrow with decorative perforations, but there are others with wider bowls. During the 19th century, asparagus was sometimes a finger food, but that is definitely not the case now, and it would not have been the case if it was served with hollandaise sauce or with a vinaigrette. So after asparagus, we might move on to dessert, but first we get to the finger bowls. This is not something in which fingers were served. This is something in which you would clean your fingers. Uh, this was a chance to clean your hands without actually having to leave the table. It would arrive, uh, the servant would bring it on a dessert plate with a doily on the dessert plate and the finger bowl on the doily with perhaps the dessert knife and fork to left and right. The finger bowl would be partially filled, half or less, not a lot, you don't want the water sloshing around, and it would be filled with warm water, not hot and not cold, perhaps with a squeeze of lemon juice in it, and often something decorative floating on top, like a sprig of herbs or a small flower. Now we have moist towelettes, which lend a different tone to the proceedings. After dabbling your fingers in the water a bit and drying them gently on your napkin, it was important for diners to move the finger bowl and the doily off the dessert plate so they could be cleared by servants. Ellen Murray Sladen told what might happen if you didn't. 
We warned a guest against some fine little Brazilian point doilies in the dessert plates because another Western senator had eaten one when dining with us a year ago. The senator had not actually eaten it, but he heaped his ice cream on it and was just carrying it to his mouth when he rescued it as gracefully as he could. <laughs> when I rescued it as gracefully as I could. I don't think he ever forgave me. He hasn't been here since. This second photo from the Gibson House Museum shows glass monogrammed finger bowls properly prepared on doilies and dessert plates. Mrs. Beaton was awfully funny writing about finger glasses. She wrote, it is the custom of some gentlemen to wet a corner of the napkin, but the hostess whose behavior will set the tone for all the ladies present will merely wet the tips of her fingers, which will serve all the purposes required. The French and other continentals have a habit of gargling the mouth but it is a custom which no English gentlewoman should in the slightest degree imitate. I cannot even imagine. So after the finger bowls are taken away, we can really enjoy our dessert. If it was berries, a sugar caster would be brought to the table so that the diners could shake sugar over them. Sugar was expensive throughout the Victorian years, which seems alien to us since it's such a basic kitchen ingredient. So its use had to be monitored. A sugar caster would generally be silver and have a high perforated dome like this one. It was used just as you would use a salt or a pepper shaker, which is another reason it might not have been brought to the table until the dessert. Nobody wants a sweet piece of roast or fish. If you didn't have a sugar caster, you might possibly have a sugar shaker, which was a small, perforated ladle that could be used with a sugar bowl. Would you just look at all these crazy Victorian desserts? This is also the kind of thing you might like to have as a centerpiece. Ice cream was a very popular dessert in the 19th century, especially ice cream frozen in decorative molds. These would often not be made at home, but purchased from a confectioner. It really ended up as a default dessert for formal dinners for generations. Pewter ice cream molds came in a galaxy of shapes. If you just do an internet search for antique ice cream molds, you will be astounded by what you see. I remember seeing a lot of George Washington profiles. Uh, we celebrated George Washington's birthday a lot more than we do now. And I even remember an ice cream mold shaped like a football. I got this one that we have on the screen from my collection, and it's shaped sort of like this Beaux-Arts clamshell. Just open it up, fill it a bit over full with your preferred flavor. I think the Victorians most often liked vanilla. Freeze, unmold carefully, and serve. I guarantee you from personal experience, it's a lot easier to have the confectioners do this. Uh, but you can see with a shape like this, it would make a nice container for berries in ice cream once it was done. Ellen Maury Sladen described one that she enjoyed at a Washington lunch party, pink roses falling out of a pink sugar umbrella into spun candy snow. I also have to share with you this charming pot de creme cup from the Gibson House Museum. Pot de creme is a creamy custard, usually chocolate, but sometimes vanilla, which is very rich and very special and a bit complicated to make. Once the custard has been made and poured into the cups, they need to be placed in a pan of hot water and baked about 15 minutes. Imagine doing that in a coal stove. Cups like these were often seen in the 19th century. This one is Limoges, though covered custard cups predate the century. I have seen this acorn-shaped finial on a lot of other 19th century china patterns too. These cups are in such good condition, I have to wonder if the Gibson family ever used them. Now, after dessert, sometimes would come a savory course. And if it was offered, it would be small. It would be very small. It would be a mere trifle, not more than two bites. 
According to British food writer Neil Buttery, savories are often served on toast, fried bread, or some kind of biscuit or cracker. Something like Scotch woodcock, which is really scrambled eggs and anchovies on toast, or angels on horseback, which are oysters wrapped in bacon, or devils on horseback, which are prunes or dates wrapped in bacon, or even a bit of Welsh rarebit. But it was not intended to be an extensive course, just a digestive. And then finally, we get to the fruit course, which would often end the dinner. And it may surprise you to know that it was often nothing fancier than a single piece of fruit for each guest that they had to eat with a knife and fork. Not a Macedoine of fruit, which is a French way to say fruit salad. Bananas came to ordinary Americans starting in the 1880s. Remember what I mentioned earlier about the rail network getting different kinds of foods further and quicker for more Americans. This led to the invention of the banana boat or the banana bowl, and we see one here in the museum's collection. This is basically a cake stand made to look like a taco to contain a complete bunch of bananas. Probably used either as a centerpiece or on the sideboard to be brought to the table during the fruit course, you would have a lot of difficulty using it for anything else. A formal dinner would conclude with coffee, often served in the drawing room, but not always. For people who are fussy about their coffee, it's important to know that diners in the 19th century could choose two kinds, black or no thank you. And it would be served in very small cups, demitasse, like these, which other etiquette writers have suggested was to provide just enough caffeine to get you home and then still get a good night's sleep. For those of you who are tea drinkers, I offer my apologies. Tea was not offered after a formal dinner, whether or not you drank coffee. These days at big dinners, we get coffee tea or decaf in regular sized coffee cups with whatever sweetener or dairy product we like. But I confess, I miss these elegant little cups a lot and I would love to see them make a comeback. These, you'll probably recognize by now, are from the Gibson House Museum's collection of Limoges, which Mrs. Gibson purchased in 1860 when she built the house. What other elements are left? Liqueurs. Liqueurs would also be offered in the drawing room on a small tray. There are dozens and dozens of kinds of liqueurs, but Emily Post recommended serving no more than three for the sake of simplicity. Green creme de menthe, Benedictine and Kummel. Some, if she said also that if you were serving creme de menthe, some of the glasses should be filled with shaved ice. Liqueurs were never served pre-poured. You would always have to bring the decanters out with the glasses to pour on request. The monogrammed liqueur decanter that you see here with the matching glasses comes from the Gibson House Museum. And an interesting point about monograms, since we are not so monogram mad as we used to be, back in the day, wedding gifts, including a silver service that were given before the wedding might be monogrammed with the bride's maiden name initials just in case. So now our dinner is ending. The English custom of the ladies retiring to the drawing room so that the gentlemen could linger over brandy and cigars and naughty stories was widely adopted in America. One problem that didn't get discussed much is illustrated here by Charles Dana Gibson, gentlemen having to retrieve gloves and fans dropped by their dinner partners. Emily Post acknowledged this problem in her first edition of Etiquette, noting that a lady had to remove her gloves at table. It is hideous to leave them on the arm, merely turning back the hands, and keep her gloves and her fan, and probably her evening bag, in her lap all evening with her napkin over them all. And all these things are supposed to stay in place on a slippery satin skirt on a little lap that more often than not slants downward. It is impossible, she continues, to imagine that etiquette should wish to conserve the picture of gentlemen on all fours as the concluding ceremonial at dinners. But it was a risk, 
as we see here. And now that all the guests have gone up to the drawing room, I have the opportunity to thank you for being such a kind and indulgent audience. And I can try to stop sharing this screen, I hope, and take your questions. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Well, thank you kindly. Well, I'm, I'm happy. And do we have any questions? It's okay if we don't. I'm I'm not judgy. Any questions? Oh, someone has included the link to Mrs. Beaton's book. Thank you so much. That is a wonderful resource for anybody that wants to learn more about 19th century housekeeping and dinner giving and dealing with servants and technology. It's absolutely wonderful. If anyone would like to just ask a question, feel free to. I think we have enough of us that we could do that. Oh, here yeah, we go. I have a question, uh, Adrian. Sure, hi, Jason. Uh, yeah, first, that was a great uh, talk, and uh, you, you reminded me when I was an undergraduate at Penn State in the 1960s, there was an etiquette course. And and I can't find the book. I thought I had it. I don't remember her name, but apparently it was the first etiquette book of that period. And we actually had a, uh, at the end of the course, we had a tea. So we had we had to dress appropriately. We had to set the table. And so my question is, are etiquette courses to your knowledge taught in any colleges or universities days, or is there much interest in that? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I, you know, I worked at MIT in the 90s uh, in the Alumni Association, and I was part of the early faculty for MIT Charm School, uh, which had a, it, it was a unique MIT institution for a lot of reasons I won't go into, but they had all kinds of things about manners uh, that go on. What MIT is doing now is a series of different kinds of events called From Backpack to Briefcase uh, to get college students ready for the work world. And etiquette is very much a part of what they're doing in these programs. I have hosted etiquette dinners at Boston University uh, for students, and there is a real interest in learning how to eat at a dinner table without calling bad attention to yourself. Um, it, it And working with some of these students, some of whom are from other countries or the first members of their families to go to college, they don't all have the same experience a lot of us have had growing up eating three meals a day around a table with our parents. And because not everybody has had those childhood experiences a lot of colleges are responding to that need by putting out things for etiquette courses and dinners. Yes, it is definitely still happening. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, we also had a question, were beverage, beverages served during the meals? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I, uh, there would be different wines, especially, and, and always water. Um, Things were more color-coded about wines uh, than they used to be. White wine would be served with fish. Red wine would be served with meat. And uh, brandy would be served to the gentlemen after the ladies had gone up to the drawing room. Uh, there would be, there was a trend toward a little bit more simplicity as the century went on. And in some cases, you would only serve champagne uh, over the course of a dinner to keep it simple. And I'm like, well, I want to get invited to that party. Uh, <laughs> But there are also wonderful recollections of White House dinners when a whole rainbow of wines uh, might be offered over the course of a state dinner. I think this one that I'm thinking of was from the Polk administration. Um, oh, so yes, wine would be a big part of a dinner and sherry with the soup in a small Y-shaped glass. And if you didn't want any, you were just supposed to put your finger over the glass and the butler might ignore you anyway, because at least in English households, the butler and the servants got anything that had not been drunk after the guests left the table. So they had an incentive to fill your glass. Um, were there any dishes that were reserved more for men or for women? Oh, what an interesting question. I think brandy, absolutely, uh, because the ladies would be up in the drawing room by then. Um, but if you were going to be uh, at a dinner party, you would not be having a gender segregated menu. Um, 
one of the points that Emily Post makes is that when you are creating a menu, you have to think about how filling it's going to be. Uh, the idea that men eat more than women. Um, I've been to a lot of dinners in my life, and I know that that's not true. <laughs> but uh, that was a popular conceit at the time. Um, so definitely, um, you know, constructing a menu that would be filling for the heartiest eater. Well, and with what women might have been wearing, filling yourself up might have been more difficult too. Oh, mercy. If you're wearing a corset laced to yeah. something like 20 inches, forget about it. Um, how were seating arrangements made? Ah, that I I love seating because uh, I, I like that sort of like clandestine diplomatic activity. Uh, seating was very much boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Um, and that's why hostesses of the period were always on the lookout for extra men. Uh, because you always seem to be short a man one way or another. Um, you also had to think about who would be seated at the right of the host and hostess. Those would be the guests of honor. Uh, in diplomatic functions, uh, there would be a table of precedence. If you were just ordinary citizens, uh, it would generally be the oldest guests present. Um, you know, ladies at the time tended to be very sensitive about their age, but if you knew who you were and you knew you were in a position of honor, that was gonna be it. And it might also be that a hostess would be entertaining a pair of newlyweds, in which case the bride would be seated at the host's right and the groom uh, at, the host's, at the hostess's right, even though they would be younger than others. Um, but that, you know, that would be about it. It's wonderful to look at Edith Wharton. I was just thinking of the Age of Innocence dinner because the count the dinner was given for the Countess Olenska. So she was seated at Newland Archer's right, but Mrs. Van der Leiden was the senior lady present and she should have been seated at the right. And uh, Edith Wharton makes a bit of a point of that. Uh, was there a time frame for each dish or was it based on whenever the majority was finished with their portion? Ah, that is an interesting question too. Um, I, you know, I was just reading a very interesting book about the Titanic and they mentioned that the night before the sinking, there had been a dinner in the Ritz restaurant for nine people, including the captain, that was finished in less than an hour and a half. And it was a dinner of seven courses. So, you know, I think it depends on the number of courses, but some of these courses are not very large. People are going to get through their soup fairly quickly. If there's a savory, it's just a couple of bites. Whoosh! The place this was really a problem was anywhere Queen Victoria was having dinner. Because, you know, people don't realize this because she was so stuffy and uptight. Queen Victoria had terrible table manners. She was a glutton. And Albert would lecture her about how quickly she would bolt down her food. But, you know, there were two footmen just to serve her. And the rest had to make do with what they got. So when she was finished, everybody was finished, whether they had been served or not. There is a wonderful story that somebody told about a canon and his wife being invited to dinner at Windsor for the first time. Uh, the canon's wife, Mrs. Cuppard, had barely had a mouthful of soup or a mouthful of salad. And finally, the mutton got to her place just as Queen Victoria was finishing her mutton. Well, she almost got in a tussle with the foot with the footman, Mrs. Cuppard, and she finally called down the table, Your Majesty, they are taking away my mutton and I haven't had a mouthful. And everybody's like, what? And the queen was going to be very, oh, you go right ahead, dear. And so the whole dinner service is suspended while Mrs. Cuppard is tucking into her mutton. So that's what I can tell you about timing. <laughs> Well, I guess it's good to be the queen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, looks like we don't have any more questions. Does anyone else have anything else before we finish up? That was fascinating. Oh, thank, thank you, Dana. That's a lovely compliment. <laughs> it really was. I mean, it's so interesting because there's so 
we don't practice very much of this anymore and so few people really know so it's really great to kind of have a remembrance of it's good to have some etiquette but i'm glad we don't have to do all of it there is that but <laughs> on the other hand the great feasts are coming up thanksgiving and christmas yes. and new years and we can all think about a few of these things to put in place to make an extra memorable holiday we'll be prepared everyone who is here <laughs> thank great. you so much robert it was really wonderful i appreciate it delighted to be a part thanks for inviting me Thanks, everyone. Thank you.